Willie Morris warmed our hearts and tantalized our imaginations through the years with his wonderful, heartfelt stories about Southern life. Who could express so passionately an understanding of the Mississippi landscape with its contrasting and often contradictory faces? For his readers, the answer is Willie Morris. For Morris, it was his photojournalist son. Before Willie's death, he collaborated with his son, David Ray, to produce a gorgeous masterpiece, which is called My Mississippi. It includes manuscripts by Willie and over 96 color photographs by David Ray. Well, I'm Gene Edwards, and tonight we're proud to welcome Willie's son, David Ray, and Willie's widow, Joanne Pritchard Morris. Glad to have you both here. Thank you. To talk about this book and to talk about Willie and how the whole thing got started. And how did it get started? Well, I think the... Uh the original idea came about 20 years ago when I was a second year student at Hampshire College in Amherst, Massachusetts and I came across a letter my father had written me in 1979 where he added a PS saying our Mississippi book will be a great one <laughs> and I do not remember actually talking to him about it or proposing an idea but obviously I had and uh, I think at the time I had these grand notions of uh, what I could be doing but in reality I was far too immature and not developed enough as a photographer right. to do really much of anything so I quickly forgot about it and many years later uh, in the late 90s I uh, started thinking about the possibility of collaborating with my father again we had done little things together we had done magazine pieces together I had illustrated stories I had done book jackets but you know it was very limited this was the, this the was a big done. big project and this was it? a huge project and uh, and so I proposed it to him again, and we quickly got got to it and got started, and uh, and that's sort of how it came about. He was really excited about. Oh, doing he was it. very excited. Yeah. He was just thrilled to be working with David, and to be writing about Mississippi, which of course he loved dearly, yeah. and to have an opportunity to sort of put down all, sort of gather together thoughts that he had had over the years and some of which he didn't have anymore and you know had changed his ideas on perhaps and uh, and but mainly he was excited about working with David. Th there were hard questions that he wanted to talk about. Then. Yes, yeah. yes and the idea was and he, uh, that he would that he did not want to just write things collect a bunch of things that he had done written before mm -hmm. and uh, the press was very happy with that, uh, that <laughs> the university said, press the university said, press of mississippi so you're going to do something new so it would be a, a totally new book about mississippi and it required a road trip didn't it it required many road trips <laughs> uh he took a few with david over the years and um uh, then one during the book but Willie loved nothing better than a road trip. Mm -hmm. uh, Willie was a, normally a very late sleeper, and he got up and worked in the afternoon. But you put him in a car and and have a plan of going to little towns. He was up every morning at eight o'clock, ready to hit ready the road. Ready to go. Ready to go. And so, um, and we took a number, but a, just a couple of weeks before he died, when he had pretty much finished all the draft of the book except East Mississippi, the northeast part of Mississippi. Right. And he wasn't as familiar with that as he was with the rest of the state. He hadn't been in some of those places as often. So we took a wonderful road trip. We went over to Meridian and went in that area a, a bit and spent the night and then went straight up um, I want to say Highway 45, but we went on, actually we went on smaller roads than Highway 45, but sometimes we were on 45 and went straight up the eastern side of Mississippi, in and out of every little town. And I took the WPA guide, which had been written in 1939 and I think published in 1941, mm -hmm. which is a guide to traveling around Mississippi and I would read the description of the place or the road <laughs> and the way it looked looked in 1939 right. and we would see you know the places that didn't have trees then <laughs> now had trees the, the forests then were now flattened 
He it was, was just very fascinated by those things. Wasn't and he, he loved. Yes, he was fascinated by minutia. He just minutia. He loved. He just. He loved details. Yes. Mm -hmm. He liked big ideas too, and and we had discussions about the history of Mississippi and related Mississippi politics and the development over the years. Just in our discussion along the way, did uh, did he take notes as he went along? How how did he do it? I'm, I've always been interested he, in people's writing process. Um, he took some notes, but he does he didn't take them as we rode. He would usually at night when we got someplace, he would write down a few ideas. And during the day, if there were things that he wanted to remember, he would ask me to take notes on it or underline something in the WPA mm -hmm. guide or something like that. So was this a simultaneous adventure? I mean... It, it was simultaneously and it sort of existed on different levels um, because on the one hand uh, he had his own what, style of doing things and my style of doing things was slightly different right. and I, I kind of quickly realized that they weren't always compatible no. um, because to be a photographer you have to sort of throw yourself into the middle of something mm -hmm. uh, and wait for things to happen uh, and he liked to sort of hang back in the fringes and observe everything. You know, if you were a visitor from outside of Mississippi and you came to visit, and uh, inevitably he would want to take you on the, the tour of Yazoo City right. and the Delta, and you would, you would pack up a thermos of coffee and a, maybe a little cooler of fried chicken, and you drive out uh, to Yazoo City, and you go out of the Delta, and you go to Midnight and Louise mm -hmm. and Bentonia, and it'd circle around, and you'd always end up in the in the Yazoo City Cemetery at the Witch's Grave. Mm -hmm. um, but it was sort of very structured, and at the same time very magical. Um, and I, I've been on a number of those, and uh, you know I think everyone who's come to visit has been on, been on one of those little Willie tours, oh, yeah. as we call them. Um, when Willie and I were first dating in the late 1980s, we took a lot of these drives, and I had known Willie for. 20 years or more at that, is that right? I think uh, at that time. But we took a lot of, but I didn't know him nearly as well as I was getting to know him. And we would take just driving through the countryside. And then the next day, it usually took him a day or two to sort of sort out his th thoughts. And then two or three days later, he would tell me all these things that he had seen and thought about on the trip. And they were different, totally different from what I had seen. I mean, he was seeing little, th sometimes he was seeing the little things, and sometimes he was connecting big ideas. But it was, it was really pretty amazing. It was amazing to, uh -huh. the way his mind worked. Was... I mean, it was all there. He wasn't making up something. No, I, I knew no. when he said it that... Well, now, sometimes he kind of well, stretched he did, it. But not in that context. <laughs> So you, you decided that the two of you really couldn't go out together and do this whole project, but, but was there a discussion about what needed to be in? We, we had sort of informal swapping of notes and, and discussions. Um, my style of working is one that I, I don't like to put too much structure on what I do. So I would pick a place and go to it and not try to preconceive what I was going to get. Right. Um, and that allowed the work, my work, to be more spontaneous, because again, that sort of reflects the difference between a writer and a photographer. Again, he can, he can put his thoughts on paper any time in any place. I have to be there, and be in the moment and catch the moment. So that that sort of encapsulates the difference in approach, you know, not only artistic approach but medium approach. Did you always know you wanted to be a photographer, photojournalist? The I think I did, and the, and the way it came about was uh, when North Toward Home came out in 1967, the Saturday Evening Post serialized a portion of it, and they mm -hmm. sent all of us to Yazoo City with a very renowned German photographer to recreate scenes from the book, and I was to play my father. So at the end of the two weeks that we spent, I was given a, a grand salary of $75 and a little Polaroid swinger. And that was essentially the beginning of my photographic career when I was seven years old. Yeah. Did your dad always think it was a good idea? I think so. I think so. Let's look at some of these images. Okay. All right. Uh, 
This is uh, a picture of Jane Rule's back porch. I love this image. Uh, this is after a rainfall, Taylor, Lafayette County. This, it's also the cover also of the, the book, cover. And, and, and it appears later on. Uh, just a beautiful, beautiful piece of work. And there's an abandoned store along Highway 61 that's uh, also an image in the book. Can you tell me about that store? That it was the old Nita Yuma, my understanding is the old Nita Yuma store slash um, train station uh, in the Delta. And it, it, was, it was actually taken, it was not taken during the, the period I was actively shooting for this book. There are about 10 or 15 images that were taken in the early to mid-90s. And that was uh, from another project when I was just cruising through the Delta mm -hmm. and, um, and found that. But did you go out looking for particular things? For example, we're going to take a look at a picture of the... Standard Life Building in downtown Jackson. Did you go out intending to shoot that building? In, yes, I did. In that case, um, I did. I mean, I realized that the Standard Life Building is a uh, is sort of an iconic um, structure in Jackson, and that I really had to have a picture of it. The challenge was how do I do it differently? Because yeah. I have friends who have whole shrines of four or five or six different images of the Standard Life Building and how was I going to do it differently. And you're walking downtown and what did you see? Well, I had been scoping it out for several hours. I mean, they, the, the obvious thing to do is try to get it at sunset when the neon is, is lit nicely. But, you know, again, as I said before, I, I, I tried to keep myself open to something happening spontaneously and that's, that's what happened. I sort of had made about four loops around the building and shot it from different angles and as I came back to the east side of the building, it had rained very heavily the day before. And I looked over in a parking lot, and I saw this huge puddle. And as soon as I saw it, I knew what I wanted to do. And I spent about 30 minutes, you know, as the as the light disappeared, photographing the, the building in this puddle and the reflection in this puddle. That's wonderful. I also love this uh, picture of the house in the Delta that mm -hmm. was built on top of an Indian mound. Mm -hmm. It's amazing to me that it would still be there. Isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's, uh, it, it's sort of, if you've ever been driving, it's north of Rolling Fork, just a few miles on a little road, and it, it sort of comes out of nowhere, and it's, it's so, um, such an awesome sight, just being in the Delta, and suddenly there's this huge mansion uh, growing out of, you know, sitting on a hill, mm -hmm. essentially. I visited there one time and, and uh, talked to some people about that, and during the flood, the 1927 flood, not only all of the people who lived in the house, but everybody on the plantation and other people from miles around went, spent many days. That was the higher yeah, ground. They all came up to that That's where they spot. could go. How many of these images did Willie see before he passed away? Probably it's, most it's of hard them. To, it's hard to say. I mean, I, I, he probably saw a good bit of them. I mean, he, he didn't see, because we had a meeting two weeks before he died. Um, we had a bit. Two or three, three showings of yeah, photographs. Yeah, he, he didn't see, obviously, the last the stuff I did in early or, or mid to late July. Mm -hmm. um, but he probably saw the majority of it. Now, he, he might not have seen it in any specific order because that was mm -hmm. before we started editing. The, the order is a part of, of your creative process, too, isn't it? It's very much so. Yeah trying to decide which one goes where and which one goes next to. And, and linking them, you know, one image to another. And they're not, sometimes it's subjective, sometimes it's color. Mm -hmm. I, I try, ultimately, I try to thread images together so that you could have sort of a whole continuous sequence where every image is related to each one on one level or another, but you get five or ten images down the road. and yeah. you, know, you know, one and ten have nothing to do with each other. but. You know, I link them together. Something's happening. Yes. Uh, tell me about Oscar Whitfield. Mr. Whitfield um, was somebody who I had been working in uh, sort of East Central Mississippi, and I had had a contact uh, in Newton, and this woman took me to see him because he had, uh, you know, this this large garden, and um, I just spent about an hour with him and got him to show me around his his little. Uh, homestead there, and uh, they ended up using three pictures of him. Yeah, he's somebody Willie would have liked. Oh, he would have mm -hmm. loved it. I, I think he would also want to spend time with Son Thomas, wouldn't he? He did spend yeah. some time with Son Thomas. Son Thomas actually spent the night in uh, my father's house in Oxford back in the mid-80s. Uh, I was living in Greenville. Uh, Son was living in uh, Leland, and he was going to give a, a show at the Hoka in Oxford, 
and I agreed to, to drive him to Oxford, and uh, to, we, we put him up at the house, and uh, I remember we were having a conversation, and uh, we were talking about ghosts, and son Thomas said, I don't believe in ghosts, but I know they're there. <laughs> <laughs> Willie believed in ghosts, didn't he? Which is probably did. I think yes, he did. He did. Uh, who is Jim Stewart? And I, I think this is such an interesting shot that you came up with in the in the deer camp in the trailer, and some of the people that you found are just fascinating. To me. I, th I think a lot of a lot of the people in this book uh, were people I met because of other people. Um, in this case, uh, Bobby Cleveland, the sports writer for the Clarion Ledger, I knew obviously I had to have something about hunting. And I had actually spent uh, a day with Bobby uh, duck hunting in the Delta. And there are several images from that um, shoot also. But he had taken me. It was near the end of deer season. And I wanted to get to go to deer camp. So Bobby took me up to this deer camp up in uh, Madison County. And Jim was sort of the, the head honcho there. And uh, they made me welcome and uh, uh, sort of showed me around. And um, it, it, it it's just sort of a classic representation mm -hmm. of... Uh, you know, rural Mississippi uh, ritual. And sometimes you you just kind of stumbled onto people, too, didn't Absolutely. you? Absolutely. For example, uh, this young couple from uh, Scott County, where, mm -hmm. where did you find them? I, I found them at the at the beauty parlor. I, I had gone <laughs> um, <laughs> to uh, my friend Jeanette Thompson's beauty parlor in Scott County because I knew, again, I had to have some kind of representation of that kind of small-town right. organic culture. And I spent the whole day hanging out at Jeanette's, photographing the, the old ladies and the people who were coming in. And this, this couple had come in, and the, uh, the young man was getting his hair cut, and he worked at one of the nearby factories. And uh, as they were leaving, it's I just, just said, great, may, I, just may I take image. a family portrait? Yeah. And we just walked out by, by her uncle's pickup truck and uh, got the picture. Um, you also have in the book uh, a shot of Jill Connor Brown, uh, who was... I, I love what she said to me once. She said that she inserted herself into your lives. <laughs> she wanted to write. Well, it was a happy. It In was a insertion. <laughs> mm -hmm. It was a very happy thing that she did. Uh, I don't know exactly what. She said that she said. she said that she did it because uh, uh, she wanted to learn how to write. Mm -hmm. She wanted to have your help. She. And she, and she loves you. Yeah, well, yeah. Willie was crazy about her, and I certainly am, too. And, 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 and about says, her daughter. And, and, yes, and in, enlivened and enriched both of our lives. <laughs> and her book's <laughs> and been enormously on. successful. Yes. And then there's another one coming out. In January. In January. God Save the Sweet Potato <laughs> Queens. <laughs> and you're the editor of those books? Mm -hmm. She said, too, that Willie said that, uh, i never forget this, she said that, uh, Willie said that the book had to be sweet at the yes. end. It had to. Get back she to said, being "You've sweet. got to come back to the some essential core values of there's sweetness." A, there's a wonderful image in the book of the Mississippi Mass Choir mm -hmm. performing at a gospel festival, mm -hmm. and religion plays a, a, a very big part in the book, doesn't it? Well, it, it has to because religion is so much about Mississippi uh, and the various aspects of Mississippi culture, from the the sign on the highway that says simply "Read Bible" to the trailer church in Macomb. Um, and again, that's part of trying to weave together, right. um, and why, as well as the Seder on Passover. Why, why, why did you choose to, to do a trailer church in Macomb uh, and, and not do a big Baptist church in Jackson or, or, or somewhere else? I think in a lot of cases, my instinct was instead of doing what would have been the most obvious, which would have been to do a big metropolitan Baptist church, to do the, the off-the-beaten-track stuff the small trailer church, instead of photographing the Miss Mississippi pageant, do the Miss Catfish mm -hmm. pageant. Um, that by doing that, I could get closer to a, a truth or a reality or a perspective that no one would have been looking for. Mm -hmm. And that that would be more spontaneous and more representative of who, who I am as a photographer and how my thought processes work. And possibly more Mississippi. And possibly more <laughs> Mississippi. Yeah, I think you're right. Uh, Willie loved uh, bands, and he loved sporting events. Mm -hmm. And you've got an image of the sonic boom of the South uh, at the mm -hmm. Capital City Classic. Mm -hmm. He also used to like to go down to Alcorn, didn't he? Yes, went there many times. See those games. Mm -hmm.
Uh, and the teams greeting each other after the, the, the series of the stickball competition mm -hmm. over in Neshoba County. Mm -hmm. uh, fascinating place to go and, mm -hmm. and, and just study people. Isn't mm -hmm. it? Absolutely. I spent two days at the, uh, at the Choctaw Festival, or the Choctaw Fair. Um, and one of the things I focused on was, was the stickball, because it's such a fascinating sort of cross between football, hockey, soccer, uh, mm -hmm. and you know, various Native traditions. One of the uh, uh, great civil rights activists is Bob Moses, mm -hmm. and there's an image of Bob in mm -hmm. the book mm -hmm. teaching that, that math project mm -hmm. that, he, that he does. Mm -hmm. um, he's, he's a remarkable human being, and I, um, I was very touched that he allowed me to come into his class. Uh, he's a very, a very soft-spoken and very humble man, and um, he, I, I stayed in his class for about two hours through two or three class periods and before each period he asked me to introduce myself to his class mm -hmm. and to tell them about what I was doing and um, it was it was very uh, I was I was proud that I was able to watch somebody uh, who I have admired so so much over the years to sort of watch him yeah. in action today I want to show everybody this image here I don't know if I've got the right camera to do it uh, this is the back of Byron Billy Beckwith. Now, why would you want his back, and what was the process that went on? It took a, it took a long time to figure that out. This is this is a remarkable image for me because it took me five years to figure out what it was about. Uh, I I took this image during jury selection for his third murder trial in uh, 1994, and this was in Batesville mm -hmm. before they changed the move the the for the trial down to Jackson, and I had taken it and I had sent it off to my agency in New York who had sent it back uh, and they weren't particularly interested in it but I, I, I saw it and I knew there was something there and I knew something was interesting but I could never figure out what it was and I would just I filed it away and I would come across it every now and then when I was looking for something else and I would always stop and look at it and, and admire it and know that there was something there and it wasn't until I had started pulling uh, some of my material from the early 90s just to review um, for possible inclusion in the book that mm -hmm. I came across it and I studied it for a while and then suddenly out of nowhere I suddenly understood what it was about and Beckwith was convicted of shooting Medgar Evers in the back and I suddenly realized that this was my symbolic assassination of mm -hmm. Byron Deal Beckwith uh, and also you, you don't have to look at his face <laughs> no. No, you don't. Um, so it, it, it exists on sort of multiple levels, but that was when I realized that that was what the picture was about. I, I sort of had to get up and walk around the room a few times because yeah. it was so powerful to me. What would Willie think about this? About the book? About the book. Oh, he would... What, would, he have, would he have changed anything? Would he be happy with it? Would he... he would be very happy with it. No, I don't think he would have changed a thing. He turned it over just... Yeah. Two, was it two weeks before? Well, actually, and I ha put this date, he died on August the August 2nd. The 2nd. And the last date, the date of his draft is... That's mine. That's oh, mine. that's yours. The date of his draft was July 31st. There you go. There it is, July 31st. So that's when he finished the draft. And, um, oh, he would be very excited about it. He always, he, he trusted editors anyway. Mm -hmm. And he... He trusted publishers to take his material. He felt that he knew how to write, but that publishers knew how to publish books. Mm -hmm. And so he was, a, he was a very easy writer to work with in that regard. And he always loved the finished product. Uh, as an editor, sometimes I don't want to look at it. I'm scared that they might. <laughs> but Willie loved, always loved getting a new yeah. book. And he would, he would open it and go page by page. So he would. Yeah, he just have, loved holding on. To he it. loved holding. It, he loved reading it. Um, if this had been Willie's copy instead of mine, it would be, <laughs> it would be fingerprinted bent up and, and dog-eared. <laughs> <laughs> but he he loved books. Yeah. And and he would have been very excited, and he would have loved having book signings with mm -hmm. David and the whole. Mm -hmm. concept of doing this with David would have just been 
I want, very I wanna, meaningful to him. I, I think one of the one of the things I regret the most is that he's not here to enjoy this, and that we're not, we can't be together to do book signings mm -hmm. together because it would it would be quite. Because he loved being on the road right he, now. He'd love being on yeah. the road. Mm -hmm. He loved those book signings. Mm -hmm. Can I show you one of my treasures? Yes. Mm -hmm. We all got together. You remember this? Mm -hmm. In March. Uh, of 99 and we were sitting around and we were talking about uh, this book and this project mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and all that stuff and you know how Willie oh. what? No, the right checks. on the back of the checks <laughs> <laughs> on the back of the checks let me show you what I have kept for all this time and will keep forever <laughs> can you see that? let us begin with let the land itself let us sad. what is the this is the way this book is going to start. Yeah. Let us begin with the land itself. And and he said that that was going to be the mm -hmm. beginning mm -hmm. sentence, and, and off he went from there. Yeah. Uh, and is that correct? Well, I think it is. I think it, it is. is. It is absolutely correct. And, Here's the and first and section. How many check number is that? <laughs> I don't know, but how, how many of Willie's there checks do you suppose are around? Uh, let us begin with the land. Yeah. How many, how many of his checks do you suppose are around? Oh, dear. <laughs> oh, Fortunately, that one, he was known sometimes to uh, fill them out and sign them. Checks for <laughs> yeah. a million dollars and such as that. Well, <laughs> I live in fear that... Important, important checks for yeah. buying books and things like that. <laughs> right. Thank you both. Uh, and, and there's another Willie book coming out in the spring, right? Yes. Which uh, no one knew about. <laughs> well, he worked on a novel for most of his off and on for most of his writing life called Taps. And he had completed a draft in the late 80s and put it aside. He wasn't quite sure what he wanted to do to it. And uh, that is being published by Houghton Mifflin in, the, in spring. the spring. Thank you. And thank you. See you next time.